Good morning everyone, sorry I'm late, as Daniel was saying, I got stuck in uh, the famous London morning traffic coming from Oxford, but it wasn't too bad, it's not too long a journey. Uh, I kind of feel bad that I haven't brought a little flag with me. Does anyone have, there's no Scottish flag around anywhere, no? no Unfortunately, one? no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should, if I'd known, I would have brought my own. Anyway, yeah, it's good to see you all, and I see you've all come from uh, yeah. far. Uh, uh, initially, just explain what the hell this universe is, and then go on to discuss how you might be able to use it, and if maybe you could interest it, some of the students that you're teaching. In, in taking part in this universe or working it into your curriculum or in, in your class. Um, so the universe started with one problem, uh, <coughs> and that is all of these dots of light. So this is a really famous image, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope stared, stared at a really dark space of sky for days and days and days taking one picture. And when the picture came out, all of these dots were there. Now every single one of these dots that you see in this image is a galaxy, uh, which is a cluster of stars just like our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Billions of stars in each one, and there's billions of these galaxies in our universe. Um, so it's quite vast and, and, and kind of scary, but they're actually quite simple objects. There's only two main types. There's big spirally ones like this, kind of like our own galaxy, spiral galaxies. And there's more kind of, um, kind of round, uh, smooth, blobby ones like this. They're called elliptical galaxies. Um, and for scientists to understand how the universe formed and evolved, all they need to really do, it sounds a bit trivial, but all they need to do is understand the shapes of these galaxies. They call it morphology to sound like it's smarter, but actually all they want to do is understand the shape of the galaxy. Um, so there's not a lot of those scientists who care about that though. Uh, there's a few, but when you consider there's a hundred billion of these galaxies, it takes a while to look at a picture of all of them and, and classify their shape. Uh, so this went down to one student, a guy called Kevin. This was his job when he arrived at Oxford in 2007. He had to count one million of these galaxies. And he did 50,000, uh, at which point he told his supervisor he wasn't going to do it anymore. He'd given up. He couldn't, he couldn't go on. Um, he did 50,000 in a week, which is actually kind of amazing. He worked 12 hour days and 7 days a week to do 50,000 of these, but he gave up because it was such a boring task and, and also that it was going to take up his entire PhD just seeing whether a galaxy was a spiral or a circle. Uh, so they went away and they thought, maybe there's a better way of doing this. Maybe we could get more people to take part. So they built a website which looked like this, galaxyzoo.org. This is the first Galaxy Zoo, the first Zooniverse project as you're going to find out the Zooniverse has many projects. This was the first one, galaxyzoo.org. And all it did was show you a picture of a galaxy. And on the side here, you're asked to click a button depending on what the galaxy looked like. So you're asked, you know, does it have a spiral structure? If so, does it spiral this way or does it spiral the other way? Or is it a kind of smooth, blobby, elliptical galaxy? And that's really all you had to do. Or is it something that's not a galaxy? Here is a star or kind of um, a merging galaxy or something weird like that. But mostly it was just simple galaxies like this, either spirals or ellipticals, and you just have to click a button. Now, you don't have to be an extra galactic astronomer to do that. Anyone in the world who understands patterns can do that. The great thing is that computers can't quite understand these patterns yet. That's why we don't just automate this with computer code. Uh, you have to have human eyeballs looking at this. So this is where citizen science comes in. If you make a website, you can get anyone in the world, in any country, as long as they've got an internet connection, to come on and click through and deliver the data. Um, and what we do to make sure that the data is kind of accurate on top of this is we take a consensus. So each galaxy in Galaxy Zoo gets looked at 40 times. Um, and we take the consensus of what those 40 different people say. One person never sees the same galaxy twice. They all never see unique galaxies. But 40 people look at each galaxy and we take the answer as being whatever the crowd says. And this comes out as being um, on the order of 98, 99% as accurate as having a, a, a galactic expert analyze the data on, on their own. So it worked. Um, <coughs> here's a graph showing that that, that it works numbers wise. This was actually the first two days of Galaxy Zoo launching, the first 48 hours. 
Um, and this is how many classifications we're getting done. How many clicks saying this galaxy is this type of galaxy. And you can see it started slowly, but then we got some press. And then it accelerated quite quickly to the point in <coughs> 39 hours in, you'll see that there were 50,000 classifications getting done. But that was per hour. So the crowd was doing 50,000 classifications, which is what this uh, PhD student managed to do in a, in a really hard working week. Uh, and he was an expert. So the crowd was just churning out these classifications. So the idea really worked. Um, and that was great. So we now had a way of processing the data quicker. Doing it uh, when you've got a large amount of data and computers can't process it and there's not a big enough group of scientists to do it, this was suddenly the answer. But there was an extra dimension as well. The fact that it was humans that were taking part is really significant compared to if a computer could do this task quickly uh, because of serendipitous discovery. Things you didn't expect to find. When you program a computer to look through data, you specifically ask it to look for what you're looking for, the answer to your question. When you ask humans to look through data, they get curious, they do some really weird stuff, and they find some really interesting things. Uh, so I'll take you through some of the uh, kind of successes of, of serendipitous discovery, of this human discovery in galaxies to start with. Um, one of the really amazing results that came out of galaxies to start was that there were uh, more anti-clockwise spiral galaxies classified in the universe than clockwise spiral galaxies. Now if anyone has any kind of rough grasp of the universe and how it works and the fact that there's no special point in the, in the universe, the fact that um, uh, it should look the same in all directions, it's homogeneous and isotropic is what we say. Uh, so it's kind of worrying that you would see more uh, anti-clockwise spirals. That would suggest that there was a specific direction to the universe. Um, but it turned out it was a really interesting result that was tied into a completely different field other than astronomy. It's tied into uh, the brain and, and image perception. Uh, it actually turns out that humans are better at spotting anti-clockwise spiral patterns than they are at spotting clockwise ones. So they would mark them more often because sometimes when there was a clockwise spiral pattern they wouldn't recognize the pattern. But when there's an anti-clockwise one they would. So what we did is we took all the images and flipped them put them back into the <coughs> project and they still all classified anti-clockwise ones. So the, the universe is kind of how we thought it was. This isn't a really worrying result. We don't have to change physics or anything. Um, the, one of the most significant results to have come out of any Zooniverse project so far is Hannes Verwerk. Uh, does anyone speak Dutch? Does anyone speak German? No? Uh, so, this is Hannes Verwerp, also known as Hannes Ding. Um, Verwerp and Ding both mean thing or object. Uh, astronomers are never the best at naming stuff, uh, but this actually wasn't named by, well, we chose the name, but it was Hanny here, Hanny van Arkel, who's a Dutch school teacher, who came up with this uh, Verwerp. First of all, she was doing Galaxy Zoo back in 2007, and she was just delivered this image here. And this is the galaxy, so it was right in the centre and she was asked, is this a spiral or is this an elliptical galaxy, like everyone was asked. And unlike everyone else who looked at this image and just clicked spiral galaxy and went to the next galaxy, she asked, what, what is this? What on earth is this blue squiggle? Um, scientists hadn't noticed it before. Uh, other people that looked at the image just assumed it was maybe some sort of artefact on the image, something on the detector, something weird happening. But she asked, what is this? And she went into a forum and, and, and put the link into this image and said, I, I'm really confused. What is this verver? What is this thing? Um, and it turned out it was a completely new type of astronomical object, never before known uh, to science. Um, it is a large gas cloud that's actually right next to this galaxy here. They're, they're, they're joined. It's not in the foreground or anything or, or further away. It's, it's uh, it's part of that galaxy. And we'd never known any object like this before. What it's, if it's got quite a weird kind of history. What it's actually is, is a, a large area of gas that's been heated up by a beam of radiation coming from the center of this galaxy. But then that beam of radiation is switched off. But this is still glowing because of uh, the time it would take for this to stop glowing and light travel speed. It's kind of like switching a light switch off and still seeing 
in that space of time it takes for the information to travel, still seeing the light on, but the light switch being off. Uh, so it's a rather strange object, and no one had ever discovered it before. But Hanny Van Arkel, a Dutch school teacher just playing around in Galaxy Zoo, discovered this object that's now named after her. Um, this is actually an article about her and, and the ververt in German Playboy magazine. So astronomy can be sexy too, I guess, sometimes. <laughs> um, and here we went and followed it up. So these, these images were taken by a ground-based telescope, all the ones that went into the National Galaxy Zoo. So we thought, let's go check and see what this thing actually looks like with the Hubble Space Telescope. And there it is. You can see it looks like a kind of angry version of Kermit the Frog. Um, but yeah, it existed. And the next stage was, well, why don't we try and energize the community and say, right, OK, keep on doing your galaxy classifications, but also keep an eye out for these strange things, these ververts. Ververpen or Ververpes as they were starting to get called. Uh, and the community responded by finding 20 of them. Um, which isn't a lot, it's quite a rare occurrence in the universe. Considering we're looking through a million pictures of galaxies and we've only found 20. That's kind of low odds. But th these would not have been found at this rate by, by the scientists behind the project. And they would not have been found by a computer because the computer would just be focusing on the galaxy itself and forgetting about the strange stuff off the side. There's another example from galaxies of, of cool stuff that was found as well. So I, I told you galaxies are very simple. Um, extra galactic astronomers like to use big words to pretend that they're really clever, but it's actually a very simple science that involves big spiral galaxies or small kind of round galaxies. Now, the next stage on top of that is color. The big spiral galaxies are blue and the small round ones are red. And galactic astronomers would always have you believe that's how everything is. Small round galaxies, red, big spiral ones, blue. What happened in galaxies is people started flagging small round ones that were bluey green. And these were thought to not exist. These are an entirely new class of galaxy that were theorized not possible and, and didn't exist. But here we found uh, 10 of them already uh, called the green peas. And there's been many more found uh, in, in galaxy zoo. But these weren't found by scientists. Again, the, the scientists actually ignored these. There was a thread on the Galaxy Zoo forum, because we provided a forum along with the classification interface so users could talk to each other. Uh, the thread was started with the title, Give Peas a Chance. And it was started by some of the users who were finding these pea-like galaxies and saying, we don't know what they are. They're, they're like nothing you've told us about. Can you have a look? And the scientists kept kind of saying, oh, don't worry. I'm sure it's something else. And they, when the scientists finally paid attention, they, they found that it was an entirely new class of galaxy. So within the first year of Galaxy Zoo, two entirely new astronomical objects, never before known, were discovered by citizens, uh, by school teachers, by, by just people who had an internet connection and could log, log on, not by the scientists themselves. Uh, so where do we go from there? We decided to make the website a bit more snazzy. If you remember what the old website looked like, it wasn't that great. It looked very like it was made in the early 21st century. So now this is what Galaxy Zoo looks like. It looks a bit more fancy. But it's the same question. Picture of a galaxy, what, what shape is it? But we've taken away some of the specific language as well. Uh, so it'd be hard to read these here, but instead of saying spiral and elliptical galaxies now, they just say smooth or, or features or uh, star or artifacts, that kind of thing. And it's, it's more driven toward this uh, pattern recognition, not assuming any astronomical knowledge, just asking people, can you spot a pattern? And, and people seem to respond really well to that. Um, so much so that a bunch of other scientists around the world came calling when we did this, and they said, hey, that's a really cool idea. Uh, we have lots of data too, because scientists are really good at gathering data right now, not so good at analyzing it. Uh, so a lot of researchers around the world have a lot of data, and they want to analyze by people who, who can look at it. And it's normally quite simple tasks. So um, we started building projects for, for lots of people around the world. For example, uh, here's some images of the surface of the moon that come from a satellite in orbit around the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. That's a NASA project. And they asked us, can we, put, can we build a project where we just put all the pictures from this in and people mark out the craters? So any crater bigger than a kind of really small crater, you just draw a circle and that's it. Really simple task, but a computer can't do it. Um, this one along here I'll talk about a bit later is one of our most successful projects. It's called Planet Hunters. And in that one, people do an extremely boring task. I know how boring it is because I did it for five years as a PhD. And it's looking through graphs of how bright a star is 
to spot when a planet passes in front of the star and does a little eclipse because the brightness will then dip. And it doesn't happen a lot, but people look through reams and reams and reams of this data uh, to find these planets, and they have discovered uh, planets around other stars doing this. Uh, and it's, it started with astronomy because we started with galaxies and a lot of astronomers cottoned on to the idea. But sooner or later, other fields came calling. Uh, some of the initial fields were climatology um, and, uh, and, and the nature uh, 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 fields. So in, in climatology, we've got some, uh, one of our oldest projects is looking through ships' logs from the early 19th century. So, so ships that were sailing around the North Atlantic, especially into the Arctic, um, took meticulous notes on what the weather was like, the temperature, how, mu how much sea ice there was, especially. And this is invaluable to people researching um, the uh, climate change and how the climate has changed over the last 100 years because we only had climate measuring stations from the 70s onwards. But this data, people go through the logbooks and transcribe and annotate the data that was written in them by ship's captains. Um, and it says, uh, it can give us information on the, on the climate in 1910, 1914 and so on. Um, we've got many nature projects from trying to understand whales' language, how they speak to each other. Um, actually, Whale FM features uh, killer whales and pilot whales, neither of which are actual whales. They're both dolphins, but still called Whale FM nevertheless. Um, we have bat calls, which is actually a, also a climatology project, because bats kind of map out uh, uh, the biosphere, they're, one of the, they're the most widespread mammal in the world, so uh, measuring their populations can tell you how the habitat's changing. Uh, and one of our most popular projects as well, Snapshot Serengeti, which I'm going to show you some uh, pictures from here. Um, in this project, uh, a group of researchers in Tanzania, in the Serengeti National Park, set up 225 camera traps, so cameras that are triggered by movement. Whenever an animal passes in front of the camera, it takes a picture, and there's 225 of these in a grid around the Serengeti National Park. <laughs> and uh, this, for example, is a zebra. I'm pretty good. I'm sure most of you recognize that as a zebra. A computer can't really tell whether that's a zebra or a giraffe or a lion. Uh, my four-year-old nephew can tell you that that's a zebra. That's why this project's so successful. Uh, but they've got 225 camera traps that take a picture every time an animal passes in front, so they generate millions of images every month. Uh, so they need people to look at it because there's only three researchers on the team, they just don't have the time. Um, so I'll allow you guys to play around with these projects later, but I'd imagine a lot of you will choose to have a look at Snapshot Serengeti because it's one of the coolest ones and you get some really great pictures out of it. I'll maybe have some left in here. Uh, I'd also like to say just at this point, because I'll need to take a break from speaking, that um, feel free to ask questions and shout out and interrupt me because that makes it easier for me as well. And if you do get bored uh, and want to play around on your phone or your laptop, then by all means have a look at Zooniverse.org and play around with one of the projects, because then you maybe have some questions about it for after the talk. Um, are there any questions just now before I move on? Has anyone got any? I, I, I missed, uh, who initiated the project? Uh, so the project was initiated by uh, my boss is Chris Lintot. Now, he, yeah, he, he was an extragalactic astronomer at Oxford, and it was his student who came to him and said, or it was actually uh, a guy he worked with who had the task of classifying the shapes of galaxies. And Chris had this idea before already of, of making websites to get people to help with analysis of, of their data. So it was him that came up with that idea and then he launched Galaxy Zoo. And after that, he is, is now the PI on the Zooniverse project, which happened maybe about two years after Galaxy Zoo. So in 2009 was when other people started asking us to build projects for them. Uh, so Chris, is, uh, he initiated that whole thing and he's still in charge of it today. Um, but we've got a kind of funny setup because he was just a, an astronomer in Oxford. We're all based in the astrophysics department in Oxford, even though we employ ecologists, uh, web developers, a humanitarians expert, and we're still all based in the astrophysics department. And we also have another team in Chicago, in, the, in a planetarium, in the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Um, who are web developers and, and educators and such things. So it's kind of a strange group of people. But yeah, Chris uh, was in charge of the whole, whole idea. I got some questions. Yes. First, one, one is, I'm not sure, very, why do you pick 40 pictures of each galaxy? 
Like 40. Oh, so, the, so um, you can do some tests. So sometimes we just pick that number to say, right, that's enough. Like that'll help okay. us. But more and more we work on actually testing the consensus algorithm. So uh, what you would do is um, take some sample data that's only been looked at 20 times and then show it to expert classifiers, like the scientists, and see if the if the if the twenty matches what the experts say. <coughs> if not, you, you need to increase it. <coughs> if it matches, then you can try and decrease it even more and say, right, let's just let, let ten people look at it. What we just what we really don't want is one person to look at an image because if they're wrong, then that's it gone. Sure. So some projects it only takes five, some it takes a hundred. It just depends on how complex the image is or, or what the task is like. Um, some of our annotation projects where people are annotating ships' logs and diaries and, and war diaries and such things, uh, we will we'll take uh, just one or two. Uh, if two people or three people have said it's, it's that word, we'll, we'll accept it. So yeah, it varies from project to project. Okay. But we can test it against expert classified data. Okay. The, the other question, I think this is really interesting. How do you... I didn't know about this project before. No, no, anyway. yeah. uh, how people know about this project? How you do communicate so the we, project? Uh, um, and uh, do you communicate with another country's uh, departments of science? Yeah, yeah. So let them know. By nature, by the way the project exists, working with all these different s separate projects, we've got over 30 projects that are live just now. Each one of those the data is coming from different institutes all over the world who have collaborations. So a lot of it's still heavily based in the Western world, so Europe, Western Europe and the United States and North America. Uh, but we do have collaborations in, in Africa, in Asia, uh, in Australia, all around the world, um, in, in South America. So um, that, that way we can, we've kind of got a foothold in, in different countries, but we're, we're also trying to to make it more accessible around the world. So one of the big things I'm going to talk about is our translation effort. So we're, we're heavily focusing on translating everything into as many possible languages now as well. Um, we advertise a lot on, on social media, we blog a lot. Uh, when people log, uh, when people sign up for the universe, you don't have to sign up. You can actually classify without creating a register account. We want it to be the ease of access to be really easy. But you can set up an account which gives you more benefits. And all you need for that is a username and a password. Uh, sorry, an email address and a password. Um, and then we can, a lot of our communication is done through email, just letting people know what's going on and what the results of the project are coming out. Uh, but yeah, social media is kind of a place, for, social media and translations, we're trying to target to kind of get a more global thing. But I'll, I'll show you some data later on and talk about uh, like how global we are at the moment and, and such things. So Frank has to leave. She's got a plane to catch. Oh, thank yes. you so much to everybody. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Inside the, the website and communicate. Right. Twitter. <laughs> thank you so much. Ciao, sort of thing. Bye bye. That's Anis Dig you mean you you speak later uh, before. So Anis Dig the Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you said they are uh, gas released from galaxies. It's it's actually it's a it's an area of gas that is near the galaxy, and it's been irradiated by a beam of energy. But, uh, that is from the galaxy. Coming from the center outside. of the galaxy. From yeah. the center. So the center of the galaxy had a supermassive black hole and still does. Yes. And when matter falls onto a supermassive black hole's accretion disk, this area around the black hole that sucks in matter, it gives off a lot of very powerful radiation okay. in beams. And that beam has actually collided with this area of gas and, and ionized the gas and heated it up. But then that, that has switched off at some point. So in the past, you would have been able to see this beam of radiation joining both of the things. Yes. But that's actually switched off, that process, because the matter's been used up. And the black hole has turned off. But the matter is spread away. Yes, but the, the, the matter is, uh, so that, that gas out there is still shining, it's like an afterglow, <coughs> and it'll take, it'll take millions of years for that to, to also turn off. And, and, this and that is a finding, it's a new finding. You yeah, it's never, no one ever knew about these objects did, before. Did you uh, relation that effect with the panspermia theory? Uh, in, in what way, sorry? The panspermia, panspermia. Uh, that the the life 
began in somewhere in the universe and kept here to the Earth in a comet or some matter? Yeah, so I mean, so panspermia at, at the moment, as far as some, most people's understanding goes, is it's kind of possible within the solar system. This is on a much larger scale. So these objects are both the size of, of the entire, um, of, of our entire galaxy. Um, so it's, it's not so much related to the kind of cometary pans, panspermia theory. Uh, it's, a, it's on a much larger scale and the, and the energies of these events and beams would actually be kind of harmful towards any kind of life. Uh, it, it's probably quite a harsh environment to try and, try and build or at least transport life in. There's been a lot of focus in the news about um, trolls and people who try to sabotage projects like this. Have, yeah. you, have you encountered that? Yeah, we have. Um, not as much as, as uh, actually quite, <coughs> one of the good things is we don't, we don't see it that often, but we can easily check for it. As I said, we take the consensus for each object, so if we want to just do a random check on every user, uh, every volunteer in one of our projects, we can check how they agree with the consensus on each image they look at. And if it looks like they're constantly disagreeing, or at least there's a high factor of them disagreeing, there's two possibilities. One, they don't understand the task. And two, they could be a troll. And either way, we can, <coughs> we can eliminate their data from the final analysis if we feel that it's, if it's, it's uh, kind of malevolent or, or at least not helping. Yeah, so it, it does, it, there's, there's a couple of really kind of high level cases that we've got of people trolling, but we've got over 1.2 million registered users at the moment and we've had maybe two cases of that, so it, it kind of like reaffirms my belief in humanity that most of the people on there are, are trying to do it properly and do it for good. But yeah, it, it, it's something we do look out for. Uh, so I'll, I'll just move on now, but please ask, uh, shout out if you've got any questions at any point. Um, I always kind of like to put this slide in just to try and explain maybe how, like some people often ask, right, have you tapped out your resources? Is everyone in the world interested in this already taking part or do you think it can grow and expand and grow into the classroom or grow into a new country? Um, and it always comes back to this idea of cognitive surplus, which is an idea put forward by uh, Clay Shirky, who's an American uh, lecturer, and he talked about this. Uh, idea that in the modern day at the moment we have eight hours at work and maybe eight hours at sleep and some people vary on that but there's a massive cognitive surplus there's a lot of uh, brain power out there that's actually not doing much a lot of the time and the internet has made it possible for that like even tapping into a small part of that cognitive surplus to do something really great um, it can be described quite well by this image here um, the block on the left is an area showing you the 200 billion hours spent every year by American adults watching television. Uh, the block on the right is the 100 million hours comparatively that it took to create the entirety of Wikipedia. So that's cognitive surplus. That's the time that uh, you can do really cool stuff on the web with. It takes a small fraction of the attention that's out there of the, of the people and the brain power that's out there. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to tap into. If we can even take a little block like that, we can discover new astronomical objects, we can help fight against climate change, we can uh, speed up cancer data analysis by a factor of 10, uh, and these are things that we're already tackling and getting to, so we need to tap into that. Um, I've got another fun way of explaining kind of roughly the brain birds out there. Does anyone know these guys? Have you ever yeah, this? Angry Birds, awesome. Well, <coughs> would it surprise you to know that uh, there have been 16 years cumulative effort, human effort, put into playing um, Angry Birds in the last hour? 16 years of human effort since uh, like I got on the underground <laughs> to, to come here uh, has gone into playing Angry Birds. Um, Comparatively on, on, on the Zooniverse, in, in an hour we're maybe talking about a week's worth of effort or uh, maybe even just a day. If we could increase that <coughs> to this kind of level, I can't even imagine the kind of things we'd be able to achieve. Uh, so this is, the, this is the area we're trying to tap into, this is the potential. Um, this is actually, this, this stat actually pales in comparison to another game called Call of Duty. Is anyone familiar with Call of Duty? Um, it has been played by, cumulatively since it was launched, 
it's been played uh, for th over three million years. So it's actually been played longer than humans have been in existence cumulatively. Um, so yeah, there's 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 room to grow <laughs> and there's there's attention to steal. Um, this is this is this is our kind of record. I like to show this after I talk about those kind of rates. Uh, this was in January. We actually managed at one point at nine o'clock on the seventh of January, twenty fourteen. The Zooniverse had a, a classification rate on one of our projects that was over one million images classified in an hour, uh, and over this three-hour period, there was about two million images classified. Uh, um, I, I haven't phoned Guinness about it yet, but I'm pretty sure it's the highest rate of, of, of scientific analysis done by uh, humans at, at any point in history. And, and I can't imagine anything that beat it. I've put a call out to lots of scientists to challenge that and see if they can think of anything that beats it, but uh, they'd be hard pushed to. The, the amount of work that, that, that the citizens, uh, scientists did in this three-hour period would have taken the scientists behind the Spaceworks project over 10 years of their academic career to achieve. Um, and this was because it was on a television show in the UK where Brian Cox, who's a very popular uh, science communicator in the UK, told everyone to go to this website and do it, so they did. Millions of them did, which is great. Um, and in that three hour period, they discovered this object here. It doesn't look that exciting, but what it actually is, is um, we've got a galaxy here in the middle, and this red ring around it, can you make that out? Yeah, there's a red ring. That's actually a distant galaxy, a very, very distant galaxy, which is behind this one in the middle. Uh, but the light is being bent round it. Uh, so this is called an Einstein ring. Um, Einstein first theorized that this could happen when he was coming up with his ideas for general relativity, and how matter can bend space-time and bend light. So that's really just the light from a galaxy behind this one being bent and focused. Uh, on, on the Earth, and these events are really rare, that's why you need lots of people to look through lots of images. But in that three hour period, they discovered this object, and it was then <coughs> followed up by a telescope. So, by one of the UK's largest, actually the UK's largest telescope, uh, at Jodrell Bank, followed up this, this finding. They detected this image, and then they went and observed it in the radio wavelength and proved that it was an actual Einstein ring a, 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 and a lens event in the space of three hours, which is possibly also the fastest discovery to confirmation of any kind of astronomical object, especially one that was found by um, non-astronomers. So I just think that's really cool. And I'll stop showing off now. I'll maybe go on to talk about some, uh, some other stuff. This is the uh, um, planet. No, I'm not quite finished showing off. This is planet under that. I always just like to show this because it can show you that, I've showed you some really cool galaxy images, I don't know if you find them cool, I do, but I'm an astronomer. I've showed you some really cool animal pictures, so it's kind of obvious why people would want to take part in these projects. This one here has a completely different motivation. These graphs are the most boring thing you'll ever look at in your life. I looked at them for four years as, as, a, as a PhD student, um, and now thousands and hundreds of thousands of people around the world are looking at them. Because if you look through a gra graph like this, and every so often you spot a dip here, here, here. That's actually a planet passing in front of a star. This graph is the brightness of a star. And every time a planet passes in front, the brightness dips down, just like a little eclipse. And this is people who are looking for uh, unknown planets. Previously, pardon me, unknown planets or other stars in our galaxy. It's called Planet Hunters, and it's actually our most uh, popular project at the moment. But the motivation is to discover a planet, right? They're not going to see any pretty images or anything. They're just in it for the science and the discovery, which is great. And they've already discovered uh, four confirmed planets, and they've got almost 100 other candidates waiting to be confirmed. Uh, one of the most recent ones was in a seven-planet solar system. So we found the, uh, our, our, our volunteers found the seventh planet in a seven planet solar system, which breaks the record for any system ever found, apart from ours, which has eight at the moment, or, or nine if you still love Pluto. Um, but yeah, so it's pretty cool, and, and actually the fact that it's um, humans looking through these graphs, it makes it easier to find very strange planets. The first one we ever found with this was uh, a planet orbiting two stars, uh, so it had two suns. And, and, and that was also in orbit with another two stars. So it was actually a planet with four suns, which was uh, previously unknown, undetected, uh, like the first one ever found. 
so yeah, right, I'll stop kind of showing off now. Um, I'd like to just take you on to the kind of motivations now. Um, this is Andromeda Project, and again, like this, this image is pretty, but the, the images that were in the actual project were very zoomed in parts of this galaxy, and all people had to do was find um, little clusters of stars. So the images were just bunches of dots, they weren't very pretty. And they weren't going to discover anything new. Like the, the, we knew these clusters existed. We just wanted to map them out in our closest galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, but what I think is really cool about this project is that when it finished, I put up a message saying, "Hey guys, we finished all the data. Thanks. It's all classified. You can continue to do uh, to classify on this project, but we've got all the data we need to do the scientific analysis." And this here shows the drop in visitors to the site. As soon as I said that, everyone went away. So they're not on there because it's a game and it's fun. They're not on there because they like the pictures or they like the data. They're on there because they're contributing to actual science. And we've done surveys that back this stat up. The reason people take part in our projects is because it's real science. They're engaging with the actual scientists uh, that, that study this field. They're analyzing the actual data that's going to get the results. And that's one of the big things I'll try and push on you today. Can I ask how you communicate? You said that people have to register, obviously. So you don't actually have to register to take part. Uh, you, you can classify on any of our projects without creating an account. But if you do create an account, um, we can keep in touch with you and, and uh, uh, via newsletters and let you know the results. And uh, you get kind of more access to the website. You can see like a personal stats page where it shows you the projects that you've taken part in, how many classifications you've done and such things. Um, but you don't actually have to, we don't force people to make an account. No, no, but I think it would be very motivating to hear that you know, you've contributed to the discoveries or whatever. That's it, yeah. We find that the one thing people always ask us more and more is if we would communicate to them more what's happening with the data that they've clicked on. And that's mostly my job. I'm actually the community manager at this universe and communications, um, uh, kind of communications officer. I, I would, like, I've got strange titles, but essentially my job is to talk to the community and let them know like how they've been contributing, trying to get them to come back, especially. And one of the ways to do that is to say, listen, you clicked on this and gave us these classifications last week, and look, we've discovered a new planet because of them. Well done. Here's your name on the scientific paper and such things. So we do, We also we publish author lists in, in the papers whenever anything's discovered that include anyone who's taken part in the analysis. And this seems to be what drives people to take part in our project. Um, so, <coughs> One of the other really cool aspects of it is that it's not just getting people to do the clicks and having them as mindless automatons and, and data processing units, but we give them a discussion area. Each project has a discussion area called Talk. So this is the snapshot Serengeti Talk. And it's, the web developers would kill me if I said this, but it's kind of a social network. They, they claim it's not a social network, but it basically is. It's a strange social network. Uh, you can comment on any of the images you see in any project, but you can also go in and there's discussion boards and, and fora and such things where you can discuss with other volunteers the, the project. You can discuss anything you want with them, but you, we try and get them to discuss the science. Uh, the other cool thing, the really cool thing about this is that the, the scientists hang around on here. So this is an area where um, a random volunteer from one side of the world can discuss with the leading scientists in that field. Um, the, the actual science and, and, and help each other to, well, the scientists can help that person to understand and that person can help the scientists to analyze their data. Uh, and that is one of our most popular ways of, of bringing people into the project. The fact that they kind of broken down the barriers between uh, research scientists and the general public and they're all kind of working as one on here. And if you do go into these areas, you will see people with tags of scientists and there's other people who are moderators who are really kind of energetic members of the community who come on and, and help new people um, out with their queries and, and, and their comments. Um, also, people just really like to make little hashtag comments on, on these images, which you can search for. So you can say hashtag zebra or hashtag cute and stuff, such things, and you can see all the kind of pretty images. Um, here's one, for example. So each image has a kind of very kind of Twitter or Facebook <coughs> like comment area. Um, and yeah, sometimes people are saying, just maybe silly stuff, and then other times people are actually tagging it, right? That's a line, so we can search the database, or other people can search that database and deliver all pictures of lines, and they can look through them. 
and you can set up collections in, in Talk as well. So you can say, right, whenever anyone hashtags anything as a line, put it into a collection for me. Or you can do that on Galaxy Zoo and, and look for different types of galaxies. Uh, and that's a really good way of kind of building up a data set to look through um, it, on your own time rather than the ones you just see in the classification interface. Um, one of the other resources we have is Zoo Teach, which you guys might be especially interested in. Uh, this is kind of almost like a wiki that we've set up for lesson plans based around our projects. So you can go on, and if you've got a Zooniverse account, you can log in. It's all very easy, very simple. Um, you don't have to log in to see this stuff. Uh, these are the existing lessons, so you can choose from uh, some of the fields that uh, our projects lie under, sciences might be especially interesting to you. Let's say you go in and you, you look for a science, uh, you go in there, you'll, you'll see there's a bunch of lessons in and they're all marked uh, kind of by age range, who they're suitable for. And these have been created by other teachers around the world and some of our own educators. We employ three full-time educators at Zooniverse who create lesson plans and who maintain this site. Um, and the cool thing is... Sorry? Can you show us, enter and show us? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, after, after example, the, yeah. Yeah, after the talk we can, we can have a play around on it, definitely. Um, uh, so, this is kind of what you can do on your own, like, you don't just have to look at the lessons that are there, you create your own lesson, uh, and it's all very simple. You, once you've been playing around on a project and you think, right, I want my pupils to classify mm -hmm. uh, through Galaxy Zoo until they find 15 spiral galaxies and then you know say something comment about their color or how tight their spiral arms are so you can create a title for it write your description out and then choose from the drop down list you can choose any of our projects which age range it suits and then submit it to the site and it will exist there as a lesson um, so yeah we can have a play around in that uh, definitely i think most people have laptops don't they uh, there's You've also, like, most people are at least able to crowd around a laptop two or three together. So yeah. Um, another educational thing we're working on is um, educational interventions in the classification interface. So um, I created this one myself for Planet Hunters, which is the kind of prototype for this. But we're going to try and put these into all of our projects. Uh, where while you're classifying. Uh, maybe after every 10 galaxies you see, you'll get a piece of education telling you about the background science and actually more about the science. Because at the moment, we just want to get people into the projects as quickly as possible without giving them all the information. You don't need to know everything about galaxies to spot the difference between a spiral and an elliptical galaxy. That's the whole point. But maybe you want to find out once you start taking part in the project. Maybe you want to learn more about the science. Uh, so, at the moment, we've got this rolling out on Planet Hunters, and every few classifications, an uh, educational slide pops up to teach you more about exoplanets and about uh, stars and, and solar systems and such things. Uh, so, we're going to launch that for Galaxy Zoo as well soon, and then hopefully more and more projects. Um, you don't have to do it, you can opt in or out. It's not forced upon the volunteer, but it's, it's an optional thing, and we find that about 50% of people opt in. Uh, so far, and 50% of people opt out. Um, and now, just to say a quick note on how we're trying to expand, like uh, I've told you before, we're working on translations. I guess you guys might be especially interested in, in that. Um, it's hard for me to actually tell you how many languages we've got and, and, and uh, how many we support and which ones are which project, because we've got 30 projects and they're all individually translated by different people into different languages. But I can say we've got, um, off the top of my head, I could probably name about 30 or 40 languages that at least we have one project in. Um, and this is, this is an example of Mandarin uh, for Galaxy Zoo. Um, but there's a few other languages that Galaxy Zoo is translated in. And the thing that's made this really easy is we've set up a translation website where anyone who wants to translate uh, as a universe project can come on. And we give them access to this site and then they can choose the project. So if you want to uh, translate Plankton Portal, you can click on Plankton Portal and you'll be taken to this part here and you can see existing translations that are taking part, uh, taking place. Uh, so here are all the languages that currently Plankton Portal is being translated into. Or you can add a new language uh, yourself from a drop-down list if you happen to be an expert. 
uh, on a language that's not already being worked on, and you want to translate the project into that language. So through this interface, we're actually getting a, a lot of translations because uh, the other thing we're doing is breaking down the text into very small chunks and only asking people to do. They don't. They can only do that if they want, or sometimes it's even just one word or two words. And we're actually kind of crowdsourcing and getting volunteers to do the translation as well, in a similar way to how we run the site. Uh, so it seems to be working, um, but I'm sure there's a bunch of people in this room who speak a language that's not up there. So if you are interested, then please get in touch with me, or if you know people who would be up for translating, then I'm always happy to, to be put in contact. But it, it does seem to be working, and it, we are branching out into kind of people are using these languages, they're not just going on to the English version, that we actually find that people in these countries are using their, their, their mother tongue, which seems maybe obvious, but we're worried that they might not, um, but it seems to be working. In the um, so I'll just finish on a couple of slides about where our volunteers are in the world. We did this year in, in January pass 1 million volunteers, we're now 1.24 million volunteers registered. But as I say, you don't have to register, so there's another few hundred thousand people probably who have taken part who aren't registered. Uh, but they do really map out the Western world, world still. I mean, this is down to the fact that historically we're... I mean, it's, it's many factors that you'll all understand. Uh, it's, it's in English originally. Um, uh, it's, it relies on a kind of good internet connection uh, and many other kind of aspects towards how science is taught around the world probably lend to the fact that we really do focus on, on, on the Western world. But Europe and the United States only make up uh, two-thirds. So one-third of all the other people taking part in the universe are from the rest of the world, which is not, not too bad. Um, and in this, this is since we kind of launched the universe in 2009, up until the beginning of this year, uh, there's only two or three countries on this map that aren't represented, that people have never taken part in a project from. I think one's North Korea and the other one possibly Chad. I'm not sure why that is, but um, and that's that that as I said, that was over a five year period. This is actually just the last week, uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, because the only countries here where there haven't been people visiting our site in the last week are the ones that are uh, this colour. And um, so there's maybe only 20 or 30 countries on this map where in the last week there haven't been people taking part. So hopefully we're doing something right to try and uh, try and get this university in a place that people from other countries can can come on and take part. Uh, and that's also kind of why I'm here speaking to you guys, because <laughs> you might be able to help me also understand how I can get uh, people uh, in the countries that you're all from to, to want to take part in the, in the universe. Uh, I think I'll skip my last slide because that's a kind of scary thing that's not that relevant to what I want to talk about today. Uh, just quickly, we have a, a, we have a plan uh, that we're working on just now to make it easy for anyone to build a project. So rather than us building all the projects, uh, you guys could come on with your class and build a project if you've got a bunch of images. Maybe you've gone out and taken a thousand pictures of leaves with your class. Uh, you can build your own project to analyze them, or if you just happen to have something else, if you're a, you know, you could still be a group of scientists from CERN, they could make their own project. So this is what we're building at the moment. So uh, rather than us building five projects a year, we're going to allow everyone around the world to build projects on our platform. Uh, so we should get a few hundred projects every year. Uh, but that's kind of nerve-wracking for us. We don't know if that's going to work or not, but we're going to roll it out in the new year and see if that uh, works. Anyway, that's, that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you've got any questions, we can go over them just now and then maybe have a play around on the sites or something. I don't know how much time we've got. Yeah. 20 minutes. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, if, there are, yeah, if there's any questions just now, then feel free to ask them. But at the same time, <coughs> if you want to like open up laptops and have a play around on one of the projects or on Zoo Teach or something that I mentioned, I'm happy to come around and like talk people through stuff. Uh,